The one on the left is by Marguerite Carl. It's called Homeland Insecurity. It's a set of potted fake industrial hemp plants embedded with audio messages conveying factual data about this really very beneficial crop, which has some 40,000 uses and could replace any number of petroleum products. The real reason hemp is outlawed by the U.S. government, because they don't want those products replaced. Since then, she's been collaborating with another Weather Report participant, Slovenian artist Marietta Potrick, uh, whose piece is on the right. This is a uh, uh, dry toilet in Caracas. Uh, Potrick work as she works in sort of beleaguered urban communities around the world to discover prototypes of innovative products to improve the lives of the resourceful poor. She doesn't necessarily invent these things personally, which is interesting, but she's not a Sherry Levine, but sees herself as a storyteller who builds stories with architectural material. So she'll take other people's inventions and then build a narrative around it and build the thing itself. The two of Marguerite and Marietta are working together in Italy at the moment on a project, collaborative project. The one on the left is by Judith Hersko. I'm not doing this uh, a favor by showing only one thing, but it's a heart and lung, human heart and lung made of shell. Uh, and there, this is a whole long line of these uh, glowing, beautifully glowing orbs. And it shows the gradual disintegration of the heart and lung uh, suspended in low oxygen water, chronicling the acidifying effect of increasing carbon dioxide emissions on the oceans. And on the right, Janet Koenig and Greg Cholet illuminated the statistics about the effects of the millions of discarded computers on our bodies and the ways that when they are improperly recycled, they contribute carbons and hazardous chemicals to global warming and to global ill health. That was a, a Public, they actually, these were sort of mounted, the posters were sort of mounted on these piles of discarded computers wrapped in shrink wrap as public sculpture. And finally, thinking about Hurricane Katrina, Mary Miss, working with a local hydrologist, documented with blue dots what she calls acupuncture or prompts, the potential high water marks on buildings and trees around the town, asking people to think about the future and connect the dots to look at our failure to combine smart water management with smart land use. I could go on and on here, but hopefully this will help expand the definition of feminist art, which has always been passionately contested. It's one of our strengths that there never was a single unified feminism or a single feminist community, despite attempts by the dominant culture to conflate us into some short-lived movement, bra burners, God forbid, and to, <laughs> and to blame each branch for the supposed sins of the others. But I believe there was and still is something that might be called a feminist culture, not to be confused with cultural feminism, and that it's healthily embedded in works like these last few as well as everything else I've shown. Uh, the one on the left is a very early piece by Laurie Anderson, and it's, it's called Duet on Ice. Uh, so I thought it was sort of a proper climate change thing. She was in ice skates were embedded in, in blocks of ice, and she played the violin, which she was professionally trained to play until the ice melted. <laughs> ice skates again. I hadn't realized that was going to be a, a theme of the evening. <laughs> and the one on the right is Judy Chicago's Butterfly Atmosphere from the 60s. Oh, where was I? Okay. Today, the notion of feminist community is splintered, in part because so much in the world has changed and because of the fragmentation of the cyber age. But 30-odd years ago, a group from the LA Women's Building arrived at these functions for a feminist culture raising consciousness, inviting dialogue, and transforming culture. Still sounds pretty good to me. My own version around that time was that feminist culture is a value system, a revolutionary strategy, and a way of life. When I first became a feminist 40 years ago, I compared it to jumping off a bridge and wondering halfway down if this was really a good idea. <laughs> but there aren't a lot of recovering post-feminist art workers from that period, if there are any. Feminism changes lives, and they usually stay that way. Thank you, and look forward to questions.
thank you. It was interesting to see how that works, the standing up business. <laughs> Thank you for whoever started it. <laughs> um, I guess I have to talk into this, don't I? Can I get it over here so I can, yeah? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so you can walk oh, okay. I don't need to walk, but I need to. No, you don't have to stand. Yeah. Questions don't have to be. I talked about a very narrow aspect of all of what we've been talking about this whole thing, so whatever. <laughs> Um, I read your book from the center when I was an art student at UMass in the 80s. It had such a profound effect on me. I'm always wondering, was there a sequel to From, from the Center? What, what is um, your um, evaluation of the state of women in the arts now? Well, there um, was sort of a sequel called The Pink Glass Swan, which reprinted some things from that, and it's still in print by the New Press, which is my publisher, except when I go too far off the path and they won't publish... Indian things or Western things or anything, but um, but it I'm, I don't know. You know, this this represents uh, obviously a very optimistic view. It represents me and my friends' view of feminism, and probably there are a lot of people with very different ones. But when young women stand up and say, "Well, we don't call ourselves a feminist," one one time, one woman told me she said, "Well, I don't call myself a feminist, but I stand up for myself." And I said, "Well, you know, that's good, but." Feminism is standing up for other women, <laughs> you know, not just yourself. And that seemed to be a lesson that's got a little bit lost somewhere along the way. And when people say they're not feminists anymore, it sort of hurts us old folks. <laughs> you know, we, it makes us sad because we worked very hard so that at least it would be a cultural alternative from now on forever. I mean, and, and of course, we had predecessors in this same endeavor. Our grandmothers. My grandmother was briefly a suffragette, or actually, they didn't like to call it a suffragist, not a suffragette. So, <laughs> so I, don't, I don't, you know, it's you all who are going to do the figuring out of what happens to feminism or whether you want to call yourselves feminists or not, or whether it just has become an honorific for the last generation or whatever. <laughs> I do hope you realize, and, and you can't help but have missed the messages from the artists who, who spoke this morning, that. Uh, there's, there's no post-feminism yet. There may be a forgetting of feminism, but there's nothing. The goals have not been met. They, on the other hand, there's been a huge change in the way women are treated and the number of women that are in galleries and what have you. Uh, I think that that's not the whole story, how many people are in galleries or how many people are in shows and so forth and so on. And in some cases, it really hasn't improved that much. We, we protested the Whitney Annual in 1970, and we got it to... Now I can't remember how much we we got it rate the number of women in the in the annual by just sheer just bitching at them um, raised by a, several percent quite a large percent for the time and and that was it was a big deal we put out a false press release saying that Whitney was very proud of the fact that it would, was going to have fifty percent women in the annual and it was <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And unfortunately, the, the, the lawyer who we consulted to see if this was okay, he said, oh, yeah, it's just a hoax. But he did not tell us that if you, mis if you quote somebody for something they didn't say, which we quoted the director of the Whitney, <laughs> that, that it was libel. And so the FBI came after us and so on. <laughs> Luckily, they, they, they did something really stupid. They came after the youngest member of our little group. And we didn't get out and say we'd done this, but everybody knew who it was, who was Poppy Johnson. And uh, they, she was 19 or so at the time. And they came to her door and they said, FBI, I would like to speak to you. And she said, do I have to speak to you? And they said, well, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so she slammed the door in their face and called the rest of us. <laughs> but, which, but anyway, I mean, we had an awful lot of fun. We were, we were there at a time when it really was fun to be raising a lot of hell and uh, spitting in a lot of faces and so forth. When, but... It it's, may not be as much fun these days. I don't know, but you can make it fun. I mean, it's just a, it's like the DIY movement and so on. You can you can do anything you want. I I get really sick of being asked by artists. They say, I you know I just can't. I don't have the money to be an artist. I can't get a grant and so forth. And I say, well, get out in the street and use the crap that's in the in the uh, gutter for goodness. Sake. I mean, you know, if you really want to be an artist, you'll do what Merrill did. You'll make your art, your maintenance, your art, or or make your something your art. It, and lack of money should not stop an artist who wants to be an artist. And, and I know it's expensive to be an artist. I, I, the canvas, paint, everything costs a fortune, and then you have all this business business. But I really don't think that should be the, the first thing we think about. 
And when Rebecca yep, was talking this morning about living a man's life, I thought, and I've lived that kind of life too, I think, on a lot of levels, although I have a kid, uh, and two grandchildren, all boys. I never got to do the girl thing. But, uh, but I, you know, I think we should start thinking of that as a woman's life too. Um, I know exactly why you used that term, because we all knew exactly what you were talking about when you said a man's life, but, but let's start making that a woman's life. Um, I hesitate to raise this question because I don't want to instigate an argument between friends. But, uh, <laughs> oh, but she's I pointing at Susie's. <laughs> We, we have disagreed uh, before. Uh, I know, you told me that, so I think it's okay. Um, I'm remembering Susan, Susan's, the part of Susan's lecture in which she was talking about African artists whose names had not been recorded unjustly, mm. uh, and then artists purloining their images. And so I was especially intrigued at your almost parenthetical comment about maybe it would be better for the art if we didn't know who did it. And I well, I was talking could. about a very different cultural context. Of course. I mean, not not a course. colonial context. But right. Where, right. I mean, it's, it, it's a really interesting chore for artists, and maybe this should be part of a college course, that you are anonymous for a year or so, or whatever, that you're, what you're making is not totally defined by who you are. I mean, you, in the meantime, you have to be being who you are, and like you, you all were saying in the earlier, just now. But... But uh, it's, it is an interesting exercise because we, this society is so based on individualism and, and names and so forth. I mean, when I, st I started writing, it did not occur to me to say I was, wasn't Lucy Lepard, but I, I, my first articles I published were under L.R. Lepard, so nobody would know I was a woman. <laughs> and I got rid of that even before I became a feminist because I realized it was silly. But... Uh, when we were do, protesting the Whitney Annual back in 1970, we had an interesting little... We did just fake docent tours through the museum and pointed out there was no women and so on. And that... <laughs> and that we, all we had to do was dress well and you, a crowd appeared, you know? Like <laughs> and uh, anyway, so this one, one, one very well-dressed woman who, who turned out to be from Greenwich, Connecticut, came up to us afterwards, and she was enraged. She said, I have never had any trouble showing my art, and, uh, and I, I make a living for my art, da, 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 da. And then her face changed, and this weird thing came over her face, and she said, but I use a man's name. <laughs> and we just went, <laughs> no, okay. But uh, it, was a, it was a strange moment, because she hadn't even realized that she was doing that, and she was confronting us with it. I mean, it was just an insane moment. And, and that, that kind of ignorance has probably gone down to some extent. But, uh, but, I, but I, you know, I, I do think that anonymity, that's one reason I'm so interested in public art. I'm also interested in all the other stuff. I love Susan's work, for instance. I mean, you know, so that, but, and, and Susan and I have had that because I tend to go for, as is sort of obvious, a, a slightly more simple, direct kind of work that I can use in lectures. I can't use Susan's work in lectures because I have to spend a half an hour talking about it. <laughs> And I've written about it and so forth, but it, it takes a lot more intellectual energy than some of the things that I'm showing, and some of the things have many depths that I haven't shown. So.